Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che EDC Strategies Partnership Webinar, which is titled, Early Life Environmental Exposures and Child Respiratory Health. The exposome reveals its first results. Our moderator today is Janan Jensen, Executive Director of the Health and Environment Alliance. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speaker to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Janan. Thank you, Maria, and a warm welcome to everybody online. Thanks for joining. We're very honored and thankful to have with us today, Dr. Valérie Siru from Grenoble, France, as a featured speaker on the call. Dr. Saru is a respiratory epidemiologist at INSERM, which is uh, the acronym for the French Institute for Health and Medical Research. And her research aims at identifying the environmental, genetic, and epigenetic factors influencing respiratory health in children and adults. Today, we're really excited because she's going to share with us her work in uh, a very um, a major EU-funded project called Helix and their recent findings, which look at early life environmental exposures and child and respiratory health using the exposome approach. So um, with that, I would like to thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Saru, and I hand the floor over to you to, to begin your presentation. Well, uh, many thanks, Jen and Maria, for this uh, really nice introduction. I'm very pleased to contribute to this webinar today uh, with this, uh, by presenting how results on the early life environmental exposures and child respiratory health using this uh, exposome approach. So, um, actually, uh, I will summarize uh, today uh, the result of a paper we recently published in the Lancet Planetary Health. And um, I will try to, at the end of this presentation, discuss how we could further progress in the exposome approach. So um, actually, uh, there is evidence of variable strengths that environmental exposure and lifestyle factors could affect uh, lung function uh, in children. Uh, actually, it is widely acknowledged that smoking and outdoor air pollution are associated with deficits of lung function growth. There are some evidence for diet effects too. And more recently, there are emerging concerns for other exposures, including chemical exposures, uh, like persistent organochlorine compounds, such, uh, such as PCBs, which are, is used uh, in the past, was used in the past as electric insulators, and DDT, uh, which is used as pesticides. Also, uh, there is some concern regarding perfluorinated compounds, which are used as non-stick cookware, water repellent clothing, stain resistant, and um, uh, fabrics and carpets. And finally, on other uh, chemicals like phthalate metabolites and phenols, which are used in um, the manufacture of plastics, solvents, and personal care products. Well, actually, in daily life, population uh, are simultaneously exposed to a wide range of factors. However, most of the previous studies focused on single exposure or family of exposures. And actually, there are some issues related to this uh, single exposure or family of exposure approach, which relates to um, the fact there is a selective reporting of association due to publication bias, which uh, we are all aware of. 
that these single exposure studies uh, do not allow to correct for multiple testing actually because each uh, exposure are investigated in different papers so we do not correct for the exposure we tested in a previous paper. Uh, this uh, kind of approach do not allow to take into account confounding by co-exposure or mixture uh, uh, effects, which mean that an environmental factor might have a stronger impact on health when it is, uh, there is a co-exposure with other environmental factors. So in this context, actually, the exposure approach, uh, which calls for a holistic view of the effects of environmental exposures on human health, by evaluating multiple exposures simultaneously may bring um, some interesting uh, view and might overcome the downside actually of studies focusing on single exposures or family of exposures. So the aims of our study was to evaluate the association between prenatal and postnatal environmental exposures and FEV1 in childhood in the large European human early life exposure, the ELEX study, but using uh, uh, an exposome approach, which means that by trying to integrate a large uh, set of environmental factors together uh, to be assessed with um, the lung function in childhood. So the study relies on the ELEX population, uh, which is based on six courts with similar design in six European countries. So mobile Norway, Bibi in uh, UK, Kank in Lithuania, Eden in France, in Mind Spain, and Rea in Crete. The recruitment were between 2003 and 2010, according to the cohorts, and the entire uh, cohort actually includes more than 32,000 mother child pairs. And the, the ELIX subcourt in which the study relies on uh, regards actually 1,200 mother child pairs from the six courts. So the mother were recruiting during pregnancy before the week 24 of pregnancy. And then um, we collected some biosamples in mid pregnancy. We collected information regarding the child. And in the ELIX follow up at 6 to 12 years, uh, we collected again biosamples and we measured different uh, outcome, health outcomes, including the lung function test. So the lung function test was measured by spirometry, uh, which was performed by trained research technician using the easy one spirometer and the standardized protocol, uh, which required actually three acceptable maneuvers and reproducible maneuvers. Uh, and using the data recorded from the spirometer, we further assessed the acceptability and the reproducibility criteria for uh, selecting the um, uh, the lung function, the good uh, lung function curves for the children. And we assessed actually this process for a curve selection by looking at, a sh at the shape of the curve in a subsample of 243 examination in which we validated actually our approach to avoid actually um, measurement error on FEV1 in this uh, population. So regarding the exposome assessment, we uh, used different tools to assess the exposome. Overall, 17 uh, exposure families uh, were, were assessed, including 85 prenatal and 125 postnatal exposure variables. There is actually three main domains of the exposome, the outdoor or urban exposome, which was assessed from monitoring stations geospatial models, land use databases, and satellite data. The chemical exposure measured uh, in plasma, serum, world wood, or urine sample according to the better um, uh, tissue for uh, what we wanted to measure. And then um, socioeconomic and lifestyle factors, including uh, smoking, diet, breastfeeding, physical activity, alcohol intake, pets, and sleep which were assessed by questionnaires. So this graph shows the correlation structure of uh, the early life uh, exposome in ELIX. This has been published in a previous paper uh, by Tamayo in Environmental International 2018. 
what it shows actually is, uh, so each, each square is a variable uh, of exposures. The colors show the different families of exposures and the link between the, the variables in blue showed a positive correlation and in red it shows a negative correlation. Overall, what showed this study is that the correlation uh, for each exposure, the correlation with uh, variables included in the same families of exposure were more stronger than between families of uh, exposures. So the statistical protocol was based on uh, a simulation studies that we previously performed to assess the most efficient statistical models uh, to be applied for this kind of exposome approach. So this has been published in EHP in 2016. And uh, in this uh, paper, actually using a simulation study, we compare different statistical model, regression-based model, to identify the best approach. Um, and the two criteria were the sensitivity, which uh, actually um, is the probability to identify the true predictors by the model and the false discovery probability, which is actually the probability to identify a variable that, that was actually not a predictor. So this is a false discovery. So uh, we were particularly interested in the models that have a high sensitivity, so a good ability to identify the true predictor, but a low false discovery probability meaning a, a, a low uh, um, risk of identifying variables that are actually uh, not uh, true predictors. So um, the XWAS approach, which is like the GWAS approach in genomics, which is the exposome-wide association study, actually has a strong sensitivity. So it means that we do not miss true predictors, but it has a strong false discovery probability, meaning that we are identifying more predictor, which are actually not true predictor in the model. And uh, among the other models we tested, the elastic net, the GUESS, which is a Bayesian uh, variable selection model, the DSA, which is a deletion substitution addition algorithm, we can see that it's performed a bit better, uh, actually in terms of false discovery probability, also the sensitivity was a bit lower. The, according to these results, we selected the DSA approach. So the statistical protocols, uh, there is different, several steps. First, first imputation of missing values. Um, then we are able to keep the whole population in the analysis. Standardization of the exposures, which allows actually to have the exposure on uh, standardized scales. So then. Uh, in the association study, we are more able to compare the association, the magnitude of the association between exposures. Then we applied an exposome-wide association study, the XWAS approach, which consists uh, in a separate regression model for each exposure. And we uh, corrected for the multiple testing uh, comparison using a family-wise error rate. Then we apply the deletion substitution addition, the DSA algorithm, which is able to consider in a single approach all exposures simultaneously. And then we applied this DSA um, by integrating interaction uh, between exposures to, to look for potential um, mixture effect uh, between uh, two exposures. All analyses were adjusted for a priori selected factors and including actually uh, passive smoking. Actually, passive smoking is a well described uh, uh, environmental factor associated with lung function in children. So, we were interested in identifying uh, environmental factors that are not confounded by this uh, passive smoking exposure. So, we um, a priori decided to adjust for postnatal passive smoking and prenatal active and passive smoking, all the analysis. So this is a description of the population. So after the cleaning uh, step of the FPV1 value, actually uh, we retain in the analysis 1,033 mother-child pairs. 
half of the population uh, of those children were male. Uh, about half of the population has high parental education. Maternal age at pregnancy, uh, the mean age was 31 years old. And the FPV1, uh, which um, we expressed in person predicted value was 99% which is actually uh, what we expect in a general population-based study like this one. These are the results for the association between prenatal exposome and FEV1 in this LX population. So uh, you have on the left the figures showing um, a volcano plot, showing the association where each point is a dot actually is an, uh, a variable um, showing the association with uh, FPV1. On the x-axis, you have the uh, level, the magnitude of the beta value, the association. And on the y-axis, you have the level of association minus log 10 of the p-value. And all association below, uh, above this gray line are associated with FPV1 with a p-value below 0.05. So actually, we identify two uh, chemical uh, exposure, uh, perfluorinated compounds uh, associated with lower FVV1 and uh, another variable, the inverse distance to nearest road, which actually was uh, unexpectedly associated with a higher FVV1, but we will come back to this later on. After adjustment for multiple comparison, actually none of this association remains significant in our study. And the DASA uh, with and without uh, interaction terms did not identify any significant results. So the same results now for the postnatal exposome. Uh, so now the volcano plots identified actually nine um, variables. Most of them relate to uh, phthalate metabolites. Uh, one relates to uh, ethylparaben. Copper, house crowding, which is the number of people living in the house, and facility density, which is the, fa the, the facility around uh, school of the children. And all these exposure variables were associated with a lower FEV1 uh, value in, uh, in this population. Again, when we adjusted for multiple comparison, actually none of this association remained significant, and the DAC with and without interaction between exposure uh, did not identify uh, significant uh, exposures associated with FEV1. We further looked at the robustness of this association uh, we reported by the XWAS um, results, looking at the court by court analysis. And um, so these are for the prenatal exposures identified uh, in the XWAS. So the perfluorinated compounds, PFNA and PFOA. Uh, and actually, uh, these figures show that the, as the association were quite, um, there is no strong heterogeneity because actually all the association were negative in each court or uh, maybe for BIB here, uh, null, but uh, overall, this is quite consistent across cohorts. And for the inverse distance to nearest road, uh, remember, it was uh, unexpectedly associated with a uh, higher lung function uh, level in the children. But actually, this association uh, is really, this figure shows a strong heterogeneity because actually the association was my, mainly driven by the REA cohorts. Uh, uh, and in the other cohorts, we did not find any association or maybe a little uh, negative association here. So we are not so confident about this overall association given this uh, kind of heterogeneity. Same court by court analysis of the association between uh, exposures, uh, prenatal exposures identified in the XWAS analysis. And actually it shows quite a good um, uh, robustness of this association uh, between cohorts with uh, no strong heterogeneity except for facility density around school where actually you have negative association in B and Eden and a positive association in REA. Uh, so there is quite strong heterogeneity here and it is a bit difficult to interpret 
uh, these overall associations. But for all the other, we have actually quite strong and uh, robust associations, uh, uh, meaning no heterogeneity across the courts. Then in conclusion, um, to our knowledge, uh, this is the first study addressing the impact of the exposome on lung function in children by considering a broad spectrum of prenatal and postnatal environmental factors. The, our findings from the XWAS were in favor of lower FPV1 in childhood with prenatal exposure to perfluorinated compounds, postnatal DEHP and the INP phthalate metabolites, postnatal exposure to phenols, in particular ethylparaben, and postnatal exposure to copper and house crowding. And actually, for all this uh, exposure and chemical exposure, actually, uh, these associations are supported by experimental and animal studies, and uh, for some of them, by uh, epidemiological studies uh, in humans. So uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, we have a limited statistical power uh, which was due first to the multiplicity of the exposure that we, um, we tested in this study and uh, secondly to the rather small effect on lung function that is expected for these exposures. So it might be why actually no exposures were identified by the DSA approach and that uh, the reason why we um, uh, did not identify even the XWAS analysis after adjusting for multiple comparison did not identify significant association. Association were significant when we did not uh, account for the multiplicity of the test. There is a different type and magnitude of misclassification bias between the exposures. And uh, for this reason, we should be cautious uh, when comparing the exposure health association between the different exposures. All estimates are available for future meta-analysis in the appendix of the paper. And um, to me, actually, this exposome approach uh, should be seen as an initial screening step, actually, uh, the, to making it possible to identify the, more, um, the most questionable exposure for which more specific research is needed. The results are of interest regarding public health implication, in particular results observed for DINP, um, because DINP is currently increasing in Europe, and uh, because it is used as a substitution of D to the EHP, and it is um, now among the most common used plasticizer, actually. Um, the chemical substance we identified with the XWAS approach are ubiquitous. In Alex, nine pregnant women and nine children over 10 at level above the detection threshold. So it means that we are talking about chemical exposures that are highly prevalent at the population level. So if these results are um, uh, replicated, uh, preventive measures aimed at lowering exposure to identify ubiquitous chemicals could help to prevent early life lung function impairment which in turn might have benefit for long-term health because we know that lung function impairment in early life have um, a strong uh, impact on um, respiratory health over the life course. So regarding the perspective, uh, I, I think that we should try to expand the statistical approaches uh, to further uh, and to improve our ability to address uh, these environmental effects uh, on health using this exposome research. So there is, this is some suggestion. Uh, these models could be, um, could this, uh, the model we could propose uh, could be those which are able to assess combined effect of exposures. For example, using clustering approaches with are aimed to identify actually profile of exposures. So in a way able to account for uh, multiple um, interaction. We might be interested to try to increase the statistical power um, by reducing the dimension of the exposure by integrating high knowledge 
and for, uh, for example, from biological pathways. And another way could be to improve causal inference, uh, for example, by integrating causal structure within the exposome. An example is, for example, for the external exposome. We believe that the external exposome might impact on health through actually change in personal environmental indicators. So integrating this causal structure in the uh, statistical model might help to better uh, investigate uh, the environmental effect on health outcomes. Well, I want to acknowledge all the um, ELIX uh, participants, and in particular, Martin Bridget, who uh, was um, the PI of uh, this uh, project, and she uh, did a really great job in coordinating this uh, project. I want also to uh, acknowledge Lydia Nergier, who uh, is the postdoc who performed this uh, analysis. And thanks to all for listening today. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siro, for this fascinating, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation and a bit worrying, I must say, uh, with some of the results. Or, and it's hearing that nine out of 10 uh, of the women in the cohort had uh, levels uh, of detection. I think the findings are also quite timely when there's a number of important chemical initiatives that are being discussed in the European Union and particularly the EU REACH substitution. And, and I think, as you say in your last, uh, one of your conclusions, that they, these, some of these chemicals are of concern and public health policy can prevent uh, and uh, strategies can prevent early life exposure. So very timely. And I will open up first to the first question I have on the blog. So this is related to one of the last slides about uh, DINP. So you're mentioning the regrettable substitution of DHP by DINP, yeah. um, uh, which is very interesting. And the question is, do you know other, about other phthalates possibly also increasingly used as a replacement for DHP? Uh, or if there are uh, other, um, yeah. No, actually I'm not. Uh, I was aware about this DINP, but I'm not aware about other uh, phthalate, actually. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, another question uh, is, we should, uh, more of a comment, but we should co correlate the airborne micro nanoplastic in dust and FEV and plasticizers. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm not sure I get the, the, the question you mean, but measuring actually in the air, in the air? Or yeah, no? the airborne, yes, yes, Co yeah. you know, correlating the airborne, what we can measure with uh, micro nanoplastic and dust and mm -hmm. lung function. Yeah, That's sure, you will measure the uh, Actually, the way we measured in this uh, population is uh, through, um, in the, the chemicals where mainly measure of the phthalates and, 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 um, and phenols were measured in the urine, actually. Uh, so, um, and we know that for uh, those who, with short half-life, uh, it has consequences uh, on the, our ability to show the association, uh, statistical association. So measuring in the, air, in the airborne could be uh, a good way to have uh, information too, but we might also try uh, what we are doing in our team is to improve actually the way to measure uh, from the urine samples by pulling the urines to have a better estimates of the internal dose of the exposure actually. So actually having the internal dose of the exposures uh, might be better than uh, the environmental exposure, uh, I believe. Okay, thanks. And I have one last question and then um, is in relation to the, the some of the approaches you mentioned um, in the expose and how that could uh, be further developed through European projects such as EDC mix risk miss sorry mix risk or Euromix and you know how can that contribute to the future perspectives that you highlight for Helix in developing some of the things that you're suggesting yeah. could be done. 
Yeah, actually, uh, we have to realize that we are in the uh, first year of the exposome approach. So we are identifying uh, in the LX project, uh, we were able to really well identify actually the exposome, which was, which was not clearly identified uh, before. So um, by describing the exposome, and it was really uh, novel and interesting, regarding the association study, uh, I think we still need to improve our uh, approach to, um, to, uh, to, to statistical models to better integrate uh, the exposures within the exposome uh, to, uh, to, to be in a better position to assess the association with health. And um, so how to do that? Uh, sure, by using uh, the very strong uh, statistical. So I tried to propose some perspectives in my uh, presentation, uh, but for sure uh, uh, we need strong collaboration because I mentioned the problem of limited uh, statistical power. Uh, so we need to increase the sample size and we need to increase um, our uh, uh, ability uh, to, uh, to integrate all this data. And I think the next uh, Exposome project will, uh, will allow this kind of uh, approaches. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're at the end of the, the half hour, so I would like to again, thanks for your time and for uh, giving us this overview and hand the uh, floor back over to Maria. To okay, thank you, so, oops, thank you so much, Janan. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on the CHE website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. CHE's next call from the CHE Alaska Partnership will take place next Wednesday, April 24th, and is titled, Protecting Communities from Exposure to Harmful PFAS Chemicals, the Urgent Need for Safe Drinking Water Standards in the Absence of Federal Action. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website, healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Saru, for taking the time to present today and Janan for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.